It's time for a mercy clap, by the way. <laughs> um, okay, so the most significant, there you go. The most significant thing in my background is I went to school, high school with Scott Hodge at Glenbard West High School in Glen Ellen, Illinois from the, from the Tax Foundation. So um, look, thank you very much. Um, the mark of a real pro is how quickly he can adapt his remarks to a changing factor. John Larson is an unbelievable pro. I open the door and I have one foot on the carpet and he says, Peter would agree with this too. And I thought, man, that guy is really, <laughs> really good at this. Um, look, I think the most telling thing about where tax reform is and the likelihood is of moving forward is that you've got two leading members of the House Ways and Means Committee, that is Richie Neal and John Larson, both coming in and speaking affirmatively about the process. And those of us who have any sort of legal background know that good process <clears throat> yields a better result. So let me just rewind the tape and give you a glimpse into a meeting that I had along with every other member of the Ways and Means Committee back when Dave Camp first got the gavel at the beginning of the 112th Congress. Over in the Longworth building, he whistled both sides of the aisle into the library in that big long table. And he sat down and he made three statements that everybody on the committee agreed with. The first thing he said was, the tax code is a disaster. Everybody said, that's right. Second thing is, he said, we are the committee of jurisdiction. And everybody looked around and thought different thoughts, but everybody nodded the same way. Yep, yeah, we're the committee of jurisdiction. And finally, and really importantly, <clears throat> and John mentioned this a minute ago, or he alluded to it, you cannot reform the tax code on a partisan basis. In other words, you try and jam tax reform, you're going to get nothing, or you're going to get nothing good, or you're going to get something that's not sustainable over an extended period of time. And so Camp laid out a vision, and he started to lead. And remember, there were a lot of folks in town when they first heard, heard of Camp's desire on this and, and what he was planning, it was like, oh, this is too aspirational. It's ridiculous. You know, he's a, he's a chairman waving a gavel of brown, but it's never going to happen. Well, as it turns out, Dave Camp laid out a foundation over the past two years that focused in on competitiveness as agenda, as agenda item really number one. That was the subtext of every hearing that we basically had on tax reform. Or said another way, how do you make the US the most competitive tax jurisdiction in the world? What do, you, what do you do? What do you avoid? What do you emulate? And how do you do it? And now here we are, we're moving into this season where the country is desperate, I mean really desperate, to see some sort of success and bipartisan success coming out of Washington. There's another element that's interesting in that House Republicans are prepared to be fairly bold. Remember, look at the work that's been done on the budget that Paul Ryan offered over the past couple of years. And what it suggests is that the orthodoxy is changing. In other words, there was a time when we were first trying to put the, the votes together for the Ryan budget, we were nowhere near where we needed to be, but over a period of time, 20 meetings later, meetings that were hosted in the WHIP's office, we were able to drive towards consensus and basically cross a political Rubicon and to say, we're going to go and we're going to do something new. And that is to take uh, an entitlement program that everybody loves but is going going to go broke, wrestle it to the ground, go to the country, win a majority, and come back. Now, that is related to this tax reform effort because it creates a buoyancy and a level of confidence for members to say, OK, I'm, I'm ready to take on the next big thing. And so if you look and you go back to the first observation that Dave Camp made in the Longworth Library, it's foundational for this coalition and others that are interested in trying to reform the tax code. And it's going back to the touch point that nobody likes the status quo, right? Go door to door with me in Scott and my hometown of Glen Ellen, Illinois, ring a doorbell on Hill Avenue and um, say, hey, what do you think about the tax code to the person who comes to the door? And then take a step back because you basically hinged, hit the launch codes and you're going to hear the litany of one complaint after another, the absurdity, the complexity, the unfairness of it. The, the, it's, it's so crazy, it's so complicated, and so forth. Well, the name of the game right now is to coalesce that level of anxi anxiety about the tax code, 
put something together and maybe eclipse the whole situation. So John alluded to regular order and that's what I think the chairman is trying to do once again. And so just to get back to this notion, what, what I think all of us need to do, all of us in this milieu that have an interest in trying to change this, is to, is to thread the pearls so that the, the necklace becomes obvious. Well, what are you talking about? Here's what I mean. What we've got to do is we've got to make it clear to the employee at a place of business why a corporate tax rate reduction, why an individual tax rate reduction, these comprehensive questions, why does it matter to the individual who's working the line, who, who's working um, in many of the, um, the uh, coalition companies that are here today? Because there is a massive disconnect right now. And if you want one word of sort of admonition and encouragement at the same time, it's this. Those of you who are working for member companies recognize that you basically have an undeployed resource, and that is your own employees in terms of activating this debate. And it's true for a lot of different reasons, all of which are entirely unsatisfactory in my view, but you've got a culture that gets developed in times uh, inside of a lot of, a pub of public companies that say we're risk adverse and we don't want to talk about things that are controversial by some person's definition of controversy. And then as a result, I, I have found that many companies have under-engaged in the public debate from an employee level. They have an, an attitude that, hey, you can do this. You can get this done. You're our Washington people. Go get it done. But if you are empowered by employees in districts, in key districts across the country, that have an interest in the tax reform question that the, the whole debate can really change. So as it relates to process, um, the chairman has, as, as we all know, invited the ranking member to participate actively in the working groups. I just came from a lunch where there was a report from the different working group chairman. Um, really substantive information is, is being transferred, so it's not a check the box sort of data dump, but it's really an opportunity for members to learn the subtleties of many of these issues, which we don't hear about every day, obviously, on the campaign trail, but the subtleties of which are incredibly significant over the long run. So um, my, my encouragement to you is this is the time to get this done. This is the opportunity to get this done. If we step back and we recede and we just kind of wallow in sort of typical Washington cynicism, for sure it won't happen. I mean, it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy if we say, oh, it's too big, it's too complicated, it's too impossible to ever do. So I think what you're seeing is a growing coalition among people that are saying, wow, you know, this, this is really a possibility here. So when Jim Gerlach hosts this meeting with Linda Sanchez about manufacturing and they're actually asking these substantive questions about the R&D tax credit, let's, let's get in that conversation and let's build on that and that's true of all of these working groups. So I think moving forward, now is the time to do it and um, I know your presence here today and, and your, your, your willingness to be a part of this is a reflection of your commitment, but the growth opportunities here are just just incredible. And to begin to think about meeting one of the goals that John Larson made just a couple of minutes ago, that in, in terms of job growth. And if, and if you, you run these numbers and you begin to move GDP by a point, um, that translates even by the administration's numbers into a million jobs. And that's a win-win scenario. And I think we've got to keep the aspirational goal of tax reform out in front of folks so that they can, they can build toward it. So with that, why don't we um, open it up for questions with your permission? Is that okay? Any questions? Yes. Hi, Congressman. I'm Jeff of Laura Lemon with T-Mobile. I just have one question on, on sort of timing, how, how you and the chairman sort of project out to 2013. These working groups, uh, as I understand, are gathering information and, and need to report back around April 15th, and then so how do you see this So wild horses is not going to grab a date, a season, a time, a lunar eclipse reference, nothing from me. 
um, because um, look, part of this is managing the expectation and think about um, sort of atti good attitudes that come about as a result of the release of, of these three working drafts, international financial services and small business. The, by and large, the response has been in terms of process, hey, great, did you see what's in the inbox today? It's a ways and means working draft as opposed to creating an expectation of this is going to be out on date certain, something comes up, you can't meet date certain, and you lose the expectations game. So I think the chairman is, is just being wise and he's saying we're gonna do this and we're gonna do this and we're gonna do this, but the insidious nature of deadlines is they tend to disappoint and especially artificially impose deadlines. We've got enough deadlines around here, we've got enough drama and chaos and difficulty and you know, uh, brinksmanship, we don't need a self-imposed deadline, at least not at this point. So he's, he says, look, we're gonna do it this year, the committee's gonna produce a product this year, and that's the expectation. Other questions? Yes? Come on, we're supposed to like rub some dirt on our problems and come together. Um, there's a, um, I, so obviously one of the fault lines is how do you get revenues? And this has become, you know, a very significant fault line between the two parties. And the, the, the House Republicans are gonna proceed on the basis that says you get revenues through growth and, and those are revenues that kind of come the easy way or easier way, I don't wanna overcharacterize that, but you're, you're tracking on that, and that um, simply pursuing um, new revenues through rate increases is a losing prop proposition. What's animating a lot of that thinking, um, it was thinking that was, that was well-grounded to begin with, but um, I go back to S Scott and Mai's home state of Illinois is a fiscal basket case. And it is a fiscal basket case because the state didn't deal with the underlying spending drivers and instead chose to raise taxes. They raised tax rates. The tax rates underperformed, as they always do. They didn't deal with the under underlying cost drivers. And so what's the result? In Illinois, higher than average unemployment, second amount of per capita debt as any state in the union, uh, credit rating that's been downgraded twice, maybe a third time, an open question as to whether the governor's gonna be able to sell bonds in the April offering, and um, you know, $10 billion in current unpaid liabilities after the new revenues have come in. So, the challenge is, the president is from Illinois. The challenge is, the democratic orthodoxy says, now at present company excluded apparently, but but there's orthodoxy that says, hey, it's like it's all okay. You, you know what I mean? And, and it's just gonna be great, and we're not, we're not buying it. And half of our members, more than half, have come in, in the 2010 and 2012 cycle, and they were provoked into running for office. They were basically minding their own business, and they just said, this town's a goat rodeo. I can't believe it. I'm gonna run for Congress. And so they've really come here to try and do something and not to be somebody. And they wanna fix this place and they wanna go home. And so the best, best ways they, they can fix it are dealing with the spending questions and just getting the spending going on a trajectory that's rational again. It doesn't even have to balance and you know, but just, it, it's gotta balance, but it, it doesn't have to balance in the morning and get it on a rational trajectory, and then if you transform the tax code to make it so that there's a growth agenda cooking underneath it, then, then you've kind of done your job, and it's like, okay, I'm, I'm gonna go do something else. And there's a level of satisfaction and purpose on a lot of our members on that basis. So I'd say the fault lines are pretty predictable, and hopefully we can eclipse that and, and win the debate, um, and the Senate, you know, as John was saying, the Senate's gonna have a great deal of influence on all of this. So, good question. I might just take the last question that's a prerogative and then let you go on anyway. Um, obviously, a lot of the members, your colleagues, are young and, and so on, but there are a few grizzled veterans uh, uh, around. Uh, can, have you given any 
thought and you think about what we're trying to do in 2013 and how this compares to the 1986 tax reform legislation, which of course was spearheaded in the Ways and Means Committee by your fellow Illinois and the Lake campaign. Right. So I wasn't, um, I, I obviously wasn't here then, and I don't think many folks on the committee were here then either, but that's sort of a legendary time. So um, just without question, it's not lost on us that the 1986 Act was able to be accomplished by some pretty unique factors. I mean, you had it as President Reagan's number one domestic priority in his second term. He used every bit of authority and persuasion that he had as Ronald Reagan, right? He used every tool he had in the White House, every tool they had at the Treasury. Uh, they had willing partners on a bipartisan basis on Capitol Hill and it almost didn't happen. So, um, lest I come across as Debbie Downer, I am also recognizing that, look, that's the nature of the challenge. There's, a, I think, a different, a different element that's going on today in that the country was fairly prosperous and felt fairly prosperous in 1986. What's different in 2013, I would argue that there's a high level of dissatisfaction, which I alluded to before, but a high level of anxiety. You know what I mean? A long-term trajectory here, folks, it's not lost on people on what's going on in Europe. The, the, the Cyprus story over the weekend, all the stories and adventures about Greece, sort of the, the disquiet about how big of a check can Chancellor Merkel write and what's the bandwidth of the Germans to absorb all of this responsibility, it's not lost on folks. And the other thing is, going back to this Illinois versus other states example, where we see what happens when some states are well-governed, anticipate their problems, and don't get into just avoidance behavior. And we see what happens when we, when we put things off. And so those are very stark contrasts, even within the Midwest, about you, know, you, you, you cross over from Illinois into Indiana, and the birds chirp, and the tulips are up, and <laughs> Mitch Daniels is laughing, you know what I mean? Uh, and it's, it's like, it, it's, it is an incredibly high contrast. And so I think that, that that lends itself to an environment that says folks are, are willing to look long and hard at this and actively participate, which is why I think you see the, the level of participation on a bipartisan basis, it's not just it's just not ways and means prerogative or sort of typical ways and means swagger around town, but it's a real interest on the part of both sides to try and come together and, and, and fix what everybody recognizes the obvious, that which is terribly broken. So listen, thank you for the chance to be together. Look forward to our paths crossing.